Imagine you had just consumed a wild psilocybe mushroom, one that you might have identified yourself. And about an hour later, just as the desired effects are starting to come on, you also notice that you can't move your arms or your legs. That would be kind of scary, right? Especially if you didn't know about a rare but real phenomenon known as wood lover's paralysis. And it's just as it sounds. It's a condition that reportedly causes temporary paralysis after consuming certain types of wood loving psilocybe mushrooms. In these reports, these paralyzing effects can last for hours or even days. And the paralysis might even kick in long after the psychoactive effects have gone away, sometimes even happening the next day or the day after. But perhaps the most intriguing aspect of this whole thing is that scientists and the mycological community still know so little about what actually causes it. At first glance, this sounds honestly kind of terrifying, and I didn't even realize it was a thing until relatively recently. In this video, we're going to try to get right to the bottom of this mysterious phenomenon, including what it is, what causes it, and whether or not it's something that you should be worried about. So as mentioned in the intro, the scientific and mycological community generally knows very little about this phenomenon. And as a result, there are a lot of wacky theories as to what might actually cause this. A lot of it is just based on anecdotal reports from the shroomery. And of course, there is a lot of doubt that it's even something real at all, that it might just perhaps be all psychosomatic. And to compound that problem further, there's absolutely nothing in the medical literature that defines a syndrome. But I just recently came across some amazing work done by Simon Beck and Kane Barlow. They run a group called the Psilocybin Mushrooms of Australia and New Zealand and have done some really interesting research on this topic. With a medical background and a keen interest in mushrooms, they have been able to apply some scientific rigor to craft a well done survey that might be finally shedding some light on this topic. I have based a lot of the information in this video from the results of that survey that they did and also through an interview that I got to do with Simon Beck. And if you want to do a much deeper dive into the specific results of the survey that they did, I have linked to a video in the description where Simon and Kane go through their results much more in depth. Here's what Simon had to say about this condition in general. So it's a syndrome of uh, weakness, muscle weakness, and easy muscle fatigue uh, that is associated with the ingestion of certain species of uh, primarily lignocolus, you know, wood digesting um, psilocybe species of mushroom. Um, it is not associated with all of the species of lignocolus psilocybe mushrooms as far as we know so far. Um, and it certainly doesn't happen with the ingestion of all specimens of the species that do cause it. An important point is that wood lover's paralysis can happen, but it doesn't always happen, which just adds a little bit of mystery to what might actually be going on here. The species that are most commonly reported to cause this are Psilocybe stunzii, Psilocybe cyanescence, Psilocybe azurescence, and most commonly Psilocybe subarginosa. All of these mushrooms are psychoactive psilocybin containing mushrooms known as wood lovers, which means they grow on wood, can be cultivated, but typically they're found growing in the wild. So based on the fact that these are the types of mushrooms that cause this phenomenon, immediately some potential reasons might jump to the top of your head. First of all, maybe it's, you know, since they're wood lovers, maybe it's based on the substrate that they're growing on or based on the wood that they're growing on. Since they grow in the wild, well, maybe it's because they're picking up some sort of contamination or it's some sort of bacteria that grows on these mushrooms in the wild that might be causing this. Maybe since these mushrooms are typically harvested and consumed to achieve a psychoactive experience, it might have something to do with dosage. But before we dive into trying to figure out exactly why this might be happening, I think it makes sense to just dive in a little bit more and try to understand exactly what this condition is. The Wood Lover's Paralysis episodes have a bizarrely variable onset time. But for most people, they notice it within a couple hours of consuming this mushroom where all of a sudden their bodies are less than cooperative. But some people actually actually experience the symptoms at the snap of a finger. For example, you could just be walking along a path and all of a sudden your legs will give out and you'll fall to the ground. But in general, if you experience wood lover's paralysis, you'll generally kind of slowly feel an oncoming of either your legs or your hands or parts of your body that don't really want to move. 
Worse yet, it seems that the more you try to move the affected body part or muscle group, the paralysis actually seems to worsen and the effects might even last longer. The feet, legs, and the hands seem to be most commonly affected. And also for some people, it will feel like there's a bit of a numbness in the extremities. But it's not just the arms and legs that are affected. In the survey that Simon did, up to a quarter of the people that experience wood lovers paralysis will also experience some difficulty in speaking, drinking, or swallowing. And up to 17% of the respondents actually reported some difficulty with breathing. Now, this one's kind of hard to measure because there are a lot of other factors that might play into the subjective experience of having difficulty breathing. First of all, if you're experiencing paralysis, you might be experiencing some higher levels of anxiety, which might affect your breathing. Or if you are also on other substances like alcohol or maybe things like benzodiazepines, these things can also have an effect on your breathing. So it's hard to say that wood lovers paralysis specifically can affect your breathing. Still, your breathing is controlled by a massive muscle. And if you did experience complete paralysis, you can imagine that it might actually affect your ability to breathe. Now, I don't want to be doing any fear mongering here. And I think through the conversation with Simon, he kind of had the same idea. You know, we don't want to impose any more undue mycophobia because people hear, oh, maybe it can shut down your breathing. That can obviously be fatal. Now, I don't know if there's any specific context where wood lovers paralysis was resulting in somebody not being able to breathe and that ended up being fatal. I don't think that's happened. But since it has been reported that every once in a while people do have difficulty breathing because of this condition, that is obviously something to be aware of if you plan on consuming wood loving psychoactive mushrooms in the context of harm reduction. Luckily, it doesn't last forever. These symptoms seem to last anywhere from two hours to about three days at the most. The vast majority of all of these wood lovers paralysis cases seem to have happened within a 24 hour period of consuming the mushrooms. Interestingly though, in Simon's survey, 10% of the people who experience wood lovers paralysis only experience the muscle weakness 12 hours after initially consuming the mushrooms. This would be way after the acute psychedelic effects are over. So you might be wondering, are there any real dangers to be concerned about? Well, not really. And here's where I want to kind of push awareness and harm reduction over fear and mycophobia. The acute symptoms of the condition itself, although probably quite scary and maybe anxiety inducing, are not actually that bad and they do go away. The exception, of course, is if you're doing something like swimming or perhaps doing something like driving or operating heavy equipment where a instantaneous event of muscle weakness could be quite dangerous and could lead to an incident. That being said, if you're consuming psycho active mushrooms, you probably shouldn't be swimming or driving or operating heavy machinery. So maybe it's not really a concern. The prevailing theory on what might actually be going on here is the aeruginacin hypothesis, and it involves a little bit of organic chemistry. This is bufotenidine, which is derived from bufotenin, which is famously from the psychoactive toad, bufo alvarius, and this is a very much psychoactive molecule. This compound is aeruginacin, which can actually be derived from psilocybin through the same process that bufotenin is translated into bufotenidine. Now it is hypothesized that in the human body, aeruginacin is dephosphorylated and turned into 4-hydroxy trimethyltryptamine, which is this molecule. Now here's where it gets interesting. Although there have been no studies done on aeruginacin, there have been studies done on bufotenidine, and it does have muscular junction blocking properties. Specifically on studies they've done on rabbits, it causes something called head drop, which is a form of paralysis. So if if you look at these two molecules, you can see they are exactly the same. The only difference is the position of this hydroxy group. Since they are basically the exact same molecule, it is reasonable to assume that they can act on the same pathways. And if bufotenidine can cause head drop or paralysis in rabbits, then it's pretty reasonable to assume that this molecule can cause paralysis in humans. That in a nutshell is the aeruginacin hypothesis and what is the prevailing theory as to what is actually going on with wood lovers paralysis. I guess the other important thing to note is that this compound aeruginacin 
is found in these wood-loving mushrooms, these psilocybin-containing wood-loving mushrooms. So it's not just that psilocybin is converted into originacin, but this compound is actually found in those mushrooms. So you might be wondering, why isn't this just a slam dunk? Why can't we just say this is exactly what's going on? Well, first of all, there is no pharmacological data that specifically shows that this is what is happening. But then you might wonder, since you can extract originacin or you can synthesize it, why don't we just give a bunch of people this compound and see if that happens? Well, first of all, you know, probably ethically, there'd be some difficulties in doing that research. You might not find a bunch of people who want to line up to do that. And second of all, there doesn't seem to be a lot of interest or incentive to actually complete this research. It was quite staggering to me when I first started to, to explore this and started to reach out to toxicologists in Australia and academics here. Uh, who might have been suitably qualified and suitably equipped to actually look into this, that there was absolutely no interest at all. Um, and the only person who actually got back to me said, look, maybe interesting, but the regulations just make working with those scheduled chemicals too too, too hard. Another interesting wrench in the mix when trying to prove out this theory is that it's not just psilocybe mushrooms that actually contain originacin. There is a species of anosibi, anosibi originescens, that actually does contain a quantity of this compound, yet there are no reports of wood lover's paralysis happening. So you might be wondering, how can that be? Well, first of all, anosibi originescens is not a gourmet mushroom, so nobody really is eating it. The only time you'd eat it is if it was done by accident. Accident. So since there's not a lot of people actually consuming that mushroom, it makes sense that there wouldn't be a lot of reports. Whereas for the wood-loving mushrooms, the psychoactive wood-loving mushrooms, there are obviously a lot of people consuming them. So there is a lot higher chance that these effects would be reported. Now, there is more than one theory on what potentially causes this paralyzing phenomenon. Bacterial contamination on the mushroom is one of them. And although that idea kind of makes sense when you first think about it, it doesn't really pass the sniff test, at least compared to the adorescence theory. Because if you think about it, if it was caused by some sort of bacteria, you might expect that it would also show up in other gourmet mushrooms that are foraged from the wild in much larger amounts. So people are eating chanterelle mushrooms that they're pulling out of the ground all over the place a lot of the time in the same areas as these wood-loving mushrooms are that actually cause wood lover's paralysis, and you never see that with chanterelles or other gourmet mushrooms. So the bacteria theory doesn't really make a lot of sense. The most commonly cultivated psilocybin-containing mushrooms is psilocybe cubensis. And as far as I could tell, or as far as Simon could tell, it's never been reported to have caused wood lover's paralysis. And that makes sense because it's not a wood lover. In nature, psilocybe cubensis actually grows on dung. This condition seems to be exclusively from wild grown mushrooms or wild harvested mushrooms. But that doesn't mean we can completely exclude the possibility that it could be from cultivated mushrooms. But the simple fact is not a lot of people are cultivating these wood loving mushrooms. An interesting thing to do would be to perhaps clone a mushroom from a patch that is known to cause wood lovers paralysis, cultivate it, and then see if it causes the same thing. So as mentioned, there is very little interest or financial incentive from the wider scientific community to actually test out the Argyrescence theory, which is surprising because it is a potent and naturally occurring substance that does have an effect on the human body, so you'd think it would qualify for a lot more investigation. And also interesting is that there is nothing in the medical literature about this. It is almost never diagnosed. And I imagine one reason for this is because if people are experiencing wood lover's paralysis and have a high enough level of anxiety that they need to go to the hospital, they're probably not that willing to divulge the fact that they had consumed psilocybin-containing mushrooms because of the legal status. Here's what Simon had to say about that. I would love to know uh, what's happening to people when they show up in hospitals with this presentation. I suspect it doesn't happen all that often. I think from our survey, we had maybe eight reports of an ambulance being called either by someone for themselves or for someone else or having an ambulance called for them by someone else. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't ask any follow-up questions about how that was um, how that was treated by ambulance services or by the hospital if that's where they ended up. I have a sneaking suspicion that a lot of the time it would be written off as a psychosomatic thing uh, or a symptom of the psilocybin intoxication, um, which would be a really unfortunate misdiagnosis. And you know that then may relate to why it has never been. Uh, actually written up. So is wood lover's paralysis alone a reason for people not to ever consume these mushrooms? What I thought was really interesting was how uh, how variable the levels of distress associated with this experience were. Um, they were mostly quite mild. 
uh, even even you know given the fairly substantial impacts on independent functioning that I mentioned before you know I mean 80 percent of people having difficulty walking at some point and half of them at some point being completely unable to walk during the experience um, for most of our uh, respondents they were not super distressed by this um, and there, there is a level of anxiety associated with then dosing those same species again um, but it was only about a quarter of our uh, sample who expressed having some significant anxiety about it happening again uh, from consuming the same mushrooms I don't have the numbers in front of me, but very few people, because we did ask, um, very few people said that that experience was enough to stop them from taking that same species of uh, psilocybin mushroom again. Now, you might be wondering if there's any other factors that might make a difference, because there's a lot of different ways to prepare and consume these types of mushrooms. But from the survey that Simon did and from the knowledge that he has, it doesn't seem to matter how these mushrooms are consumed, whether they're dried or taken in a tea or eaten fresh. They all could have a possibility of causing wood lovers proud Analysis and nothing in particular seemed to make that possibility more likely. So you might also be wondering if there's anything you can do to alleviate the symptoms of wood lover's paralysis, but unfortunately it seems that any of the remedies just seem to be from anecdotal experience and aren't really proven to work. One of which that is common is Benadryl, and this seems to be mainly from a post on the shroomery where somebody found that Benadryl seemed to help, but for the most part there's nothing really that shows this might work. Most of the time the best way to recover from this effect is simply try to relax and just kind of wait it out that you can just kind of sit on a couch and hang out but the best thing to do is to just have somebody there that you know and that you trust and that maybe isn't experiencing these effects that can kind of just keep you calm as you get over the symptoms so did we get to the bottom of this? Did we finally discover once and for all exactly what wood lover's paralysis is and what causes it? Well, no, there's still so much to learn, although the origination hypothesis and the stuff that Simon describes is probably the most likely. But there's still so much room to learn more about this stuff, and I really hope that scientists and mycologists are going to be incentivized somehow to really study this and figure out what is going on, because as with anything in mushrooms, there's always so much more to learn. So I do encourage you to click the link in the description and check out Simon survey that he did so you can learn all about the actual data that he got from this study and hopefully answer a lot of your questions and in the meantime thanks so much for watching this video and we'll see you in the next one do you want to become a functional mushroom expert? I've got just the thing for you. It's a new ebook called Mushroom Powered, the history, the science, and the benefits of the world's most fantastic fungi. At over 130 pages, it's absolutely packed with all the information you need to know to learn about the world's most powerful medicinal mushrooms. And the best part, it's 100% free. You can download it right now. Just click the link in the description, enter your email address, and I will send it to you right away. I hope you love it.